So good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, wherever you happen to be. I hope you're having a good evening. I'm Robert Yor Samuelson. I'm the director of Jewish studies at ASU. I'm also a Regents Professor of History and Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism. As you know, the Center for Jewish Studies is a hybrid program. We offer uh, a uh, undergraduate, undergraduate degrees, uh, but in addition to a major and a certificate, we also have a very robust public uh, education program in which we offer conferences, lecture series like this one, uh, and various other activities that are directed to people who are not looking for uh, grades or for degrees. So since uh, COVID began in 2020, we've done a lot of stuff uh, online, and I'm very grateful to all of you who have joined us uh, for this virtual learning. And uh, what we're trying to do in this kind of series is to provide knowledge about all aspects of the Jewish civilization, Jewish culture, Jewish history, and not everything is well known, as you will see, like in this series, we're going to touch material that most people are not familiar with. We started 2024 with a lecture series on Josephus Flavius that explored this very fascinating figure as an example of Judeo-Hellenistic hybridity in the first century. After three lectures on Josephus, we also hosted here Professor Alon Tal from University of Tel Aviv, and he gave us two lectures on the contemporary issues right now in Israel and in Gaza. He gave one lecture on, in person and then another one online. And just last Wednesday, we had a terrific in-person event with Beth Aim Swartz, a wonderful painter who lives here in Phoenix, and we uh, had a kind of an, an occasion to look at her entire life's work in a program that we did in the Phoenix Art Museum. So this evening and in the following two Tuesdays, that's February 13th and February 20th, we are going to pay attention to another form of Jewish artistic expression, and I'm referring to literature. The literature we will explore was produced in three locations. Um, well, in, in the Czech Republic, right? Most of it, that's what Brian is going to talk to us about. Uh, in Israel, uh, that's what Joe Lockhart is going to talk about. And in Germany. Tonight, um, Professor Brian Goodman, who organized the series, will tell us about the reception of Philip Roth by dissident Czech authors uh, in the middle of the 1980s. Uh, next week, Lockhart is going to focus on a novel by David Grossman, a novel that integrates biography and fiction and reflects on the experience of imprisonment under authoritarian regimes. And on February 20th, uh, Nali Lozinski-Vich will tell us about literature composed in Germany by children of Jewish immigrants who settled in Germany, actually people coming from various parts of the uh, former Soviet Union, uh, Russia, and other parts of Eastern Europe, they came to Germany, uh, and uh, either they themselves or their children are now very important voices within the literary scene of Germany. So we'll listen to that on February 20th. So I guess, even though I don't know those texts, I guess that in all of the conversations of the last, of these kind of um, lectures, these uh, three lectures, we're gonna hear about dislocation, uh, incarceration, oppression, cultural ambiguities, very complicated themes. But if we're talking about the Jewish experience, it's obviously part of the Jewish experience and history. So these are not new ideas, new experiences, but just new contexts. So let me introduce to you Professor Brian Goodman. Uh, you may, some of you may remember that he gave us a, a wonderful lecture, uh, in also a virtual lecture in November 2021, I believe it was, where he explained how American Jewish writers like Philip Roth looked at communist era Eastern Bloc and to dead writers from the region, people like Franz Kafka and Bruno Schulz. And these authors helped them to imagine new ways about the Holocaust in the final decades of the Cold War. He's going to do different things tonight. 
And uh, here is some history about Brian Goodman. So he's an associate, prof I'm sorry, assistant professor at the Department of English here at ASU, and also a member of the Jewish Studies faculty, as well as an affiliate of the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies. He focuses on uh, American Jewish writers and on dissenting writers or voices of dissent in uh, Cold War literary cultures on both sides of the Iron Curtain. He holds a BA from Stanford University and a MS, which is a Master of Studies from Oxford University in England and a PhD from Harvard University in History of American Civilization. And he also taught, before coming to ASU, he taught at the University of Chicago as, as a lecturer, their postdoc lecturer in the Posen Family Center there. Uh, Professor Goodman is the author of the book, The Nonconformists, American and Czech Writers Across the Iron Curtains. It was published by Harvard University Press just last year. And he has essays that appeared in other journals, such as American Literary History, in the journal Humanity and International Journal of Humanism, Humanitarianism and Development. So tonight, as you can see on the screen, he has a very interesting title uh, from behind a star. Well, we know which star that refers to. And he's going to explore the relationship between Philip Roth, Rita Klimova, and the American arrival of a forgotten Jewish classic. And I hope I say it correctly. Uh, years in vile. So Perfect. most of us probably are not familiar with this author. We're going to learn a lot. Brian, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Hava. And and I should say that um, if, if you do hear occasionally a toddler crying in the background, it's because I did the perilous, uh, took the perilous choice to give a talk during bedtime. But I think it's we're going to be fine. Um, so um, I think Hava's right. Um, that many of you may have heard of Philip Roth, maybe a few of you have heard of Yerzy Vail, and I'm guessing not many of you have heard of Rita Klimova. So um, I'm excited to, to share some of their stories tonight. Um, as Hava mentioned, one of our goals, you know, in this talk, right, Jewish, uh, the series, Jewish Literature Beyond the Cold War, Legacies and Futures, is to break down the boundaries of the Cold War. And we mean that in a few senses, right? We're going to move geographically across the Iron Curtain and beyond, um, but also move between the past, present, and future. Um, and we're going to ask, how does the legacy of the Cold War era shape the past, present, and future of uh, Jewish literary culture? So I really hope you can make it to, you know, the next two talks um, um, from my colleagues, Joe Lockhart and Natalie Rosinski each. Um, so um, talking about sort of breaking these temporal boundaries, my talk today is going to actually reach at one point all the way back to 1900 um, and then going to extend really into the sort of first years after the end of the Cold War. And I'm going to share a set of uh, interlocking stories, all of which I uncovered while researching um, my first book, which Pavel mentioned. Um, one second. There we go. Um, the Nonconformist, American and Czech Writers Across the Iron Curtain. Um, and so uh, the story I'm going to share today was actually something I sort of discovered in the archive while I was finishing the book and realized it sort of deserved its own chapter, its own story. So I've been writing about that um, uh, for something that, that hopefully will be published in, in the coming year or two. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that process and how what I'm talking about today relates to the book during Q&A, but I really want to get to this sort of remarkable story of how um, E.G. Vile's um, most important novel, Life of the Star, made it into, into English and, and was published in the United States um, in 1989. Um, so um, this is the, the cover, I have it right next to me, um, uh, of uh, the first English language edition of Life with the Star. Um, from Yerzy Weil, and it was published in 1989. And, it, and many, most people consider it to be the most important work of literature um, about the Holocaust in the former Czechoslovakia, um, in part because it was the first Czech language novel to describe the everyday experience of uh, the Jews who remained in the Nazi-occupied Nazi Prague during the Second World War. Um, but it took 40 years um, for it to be published in English. Um, and I want to talk about why there was that sort of delay um, while many other sort of uh, works of 
you know, um, comparable uh, works of literature in other languages arrived, you know, a little bit earlier. Um, so the novel was actually originally published in 1949, um, just a year, and you can see the Czech title there, um, just a year after the Communist Party takeover of Czechoslovakia in 1948. And because Life with a Star departed from the official socialist realist aesthetics um, of the era, the publication of the novel resulted in a huge scandal. Um, in fact, within months, um, Weil was kicked out of the Writers' Union, which meant that he wouldn't be able to publish anymore, and his novel was removed from circulation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that episode later in my talk, um, but I want to jump ahead really quickly to 1989. So the novel finally um, is translated into English and published um, before it's published again, by the way, in Czech, um, in 1989, and it's just months um, before the Velvet Revolution. Um, and so the Velvet Revolution, right, is sort of um, one of these events alongside the fall of the Berlin Wall that, that um, marked the uh, end of Communist Party rule um, in, in Czechoslovakia and other parts of the former, what we referred to, used to refer to as the Eastern Bloc. Um, so I, my, the, the one reason I think that this story is so important is I think the sort of improbable story of how um, Vile's novel made it its way from Czech into English can actually tell us something really important about the shifting relationship between 20th century Jewish literary history and the Cold War. Um, and in fact, I think it reveals a lot about how sort of these personal encounters um, between Jewish writers, translators, and dissidents across the Iron Curtain shape um, transnational Holocaust memory. Um, in the process, um, these same literary intellectuals um, also found ways to dissent and contest against the political, artistic, and linguistic boundaries of the Cold War era. As you'll see um, later in my talk, one of those figures is the American novelist Philip Roth, who I focused on um, in my last lecture, um, public lecture for Jewish studies. Um, and in some sense, one of my goals here is to, to describe some of the people who got less attention because he was so famous when um, he helped bring some of these writers into English translation. You can see his name here on the cover of Life of the Star. And it's true that Roth was instrumental in getting Life of the Star published in English. He also wrote the preface for the 1989 edition of the novel. Um, but there's so much more to this incredible story. And honestly, one motivation in giving this talk and writing about this is I want a lot more people to know about it. Um, so um, I want to start actually just with one of the more sort of curious and controversial aspects of the novel and its presentation to American readers. And that's actually its translator's note. Um, so the, the note um, that opens the book from um, this translator is, is attributed to an unknown translator named Ruzena Kovarkova. Um, and it attempts to clarify one peculiar feature of life with the star. So in the novel, characters are never explicitly identified explicitly as Jewish or German or Czech. In fact, all national, political, and religious labels are omitted. The yellow star of David that the protagonist is forced to wear on his jacket is described only as, quote, having a word in a foreign language written in black scraggly letters, end quote. The word itself, Yuda, is never specified. The foreign occupiers who import this requirement are referred to throughout the novel only as they. So here's the translator's note. Um, and it attempted to explain this, right? It says, the unnamed they are the Germans who occupied Czechoslovakia from March, 1939, when the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia was established until the end of the war in Europe in May, 1945. So this may have been obvious to readers of the novel, but the next part might not have been. The, quote, community described throughout the novel refers specifically to the Jewish religious community um, of Prague, which worked in forced collaboration with the Nazi authorities. So as Kovarkova writes, this self-government was a fiction and the community became the instrument of the Nazi genocide of the Jews. So um, why was this controversial when the novel came out? Um, after the English language publication of Life of the Star, the New York Times published a rave review. This helped make the novel sort of gained a lot of attention in the English speaking world. And it was by the best-selling novelist, Ann Tyler. And she loved the novel, um, but she had one problem. And that was the translator's note, which she took strong issue with. She in fact 
In her review, she asks, why does the translator's prefatory note appear to sabotage the novel's aim? For Taylor, it was Whale, or Vile's unassuming first person narration um, that transformed what she calls a tale of non-specifics into a work of art that is devastatingly specific and therefore universal. Um, so she essentially uh, accuses the translator of confounding Yuji Vile's intention. Um, so what was at stake here? Um, there's a lot going on. Part of this has to do with debates about Holocaust memory in the 1990s, right? Whether when we look like to a novel like this, whether we're looking for universal meanings or lessons, or whether a novel like this should be an attempt to under, present an attempt to understand or remember the historical experience of a specific group of people. Now, my own, um, when I teach this stuff, um, I try to explain to students that it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, um, but I think there's actually two other problems with um, Tyler's sort of objection to the translator's note. So the first is that we have to understand that the novel is a product of a very different world, Czechoslovakia in 1949. And as we'll see, um, Life with a Star was forged under a very specific set of pol political and cultural pressures. In addition to being a Jewish survivor, Jerzy Weil was a left-wing writer who was attempting to reestablish his career at a post-revolutionary moment when the Czechoslovak Communist Party was beginning to deploy a new set of anti-Semitic discourses. In, in other words, he had to walk a really careful line when he wrote this book. Um, whatever Weil's motivations, there's another complication to Tyler's complaint. Ruzena Koverikova, the person credited with the translator's note, did not exist. This is not a real person. Life with a Star, in fact, had actually been secretly translated by a Prague-based dissident named Rita Klimova. And I think Klimova's remarkable life story demonstrates how the contingencies of 20th century Jewish history communist politics and family biography shaped literary culture on both sides of the Iron Curtain and enabled one idiosyncratic masterpiece of Holocaust literature to travel across the boundaries of the Cold War. Um, and just as a side note, um, you know, if I have two goals probably today, one is to make you curious enough to go out and read Life with a Star. But if my second goal is, is for you to know more about this remarkable woman. So, Rita Klimova um, went by many names during her tumultuous lifestyle, uh, lifetime, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I wanna put up this map of the region. And this is from 1900 showing the concentrations of Jewish populations. And um, uh, this is a little bit before uh, Rita is born, but I think uh, I put stars next to sort of the key locations I'm about to mention to give you a sense of where her family came from. So she was born, her, her, her name at birth was Rata Batova, and uh, she was born in 1931 in Romania. Um, her father was named Ben Sainbach, uh, and he was a prominent left-wing journalist who had left behind a large Jewish family in Kamenets uh, Poliski, a uh, multi-ethnic city on the Western periphery of the Russian empire that very briefly served as the capital of the Ukrainian People's Republic after the First World War. Um, by 1923, the city had been swallowed by the Soviet Union and Bach had relocated to Prague, um, where he eventually joined the Communist Party and married another Ukrainian Jewish student named Hanna Korfmanova. When Hanna became pregnant, she briefly moved back in with her parents, who were now living in Romania, and gave birth to Rada. Now, I know that's a lot to keep up with, but that's sort of my point. Um, and uh, it's not completely untypical right, of especially a left-wing Jewish literary intellectual family um, in the first half of the 20th century. Hannah then returned to Prague with Rata to live with her husband, who had adopted the pen name Stanislav Budin. By 1934, Budin established himself as the editor of the official Communist Party newspaper, Rude Pravo. However, two years later, he was expelled from the party as a suspected Trotskyist and critic of the Mos Moscow trials. So now we have to imagine ourselves, the family at the end of the 30s, with Hitler encroaching on the Sudetenland and the family facing danger on all sides. In 1939, when Rada was just eight years old, they fled 
from their adopted home in Prague to the safety of New York City. Ironically, um, because of this move, uh, Rita Bott would always remember the Second World War as a sort of golden age for herself. Um, uh, she became thoroughly Americanized over the next six years while her family was living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. As the historian John Hogg puts it, as a student in Manhattan public schools, Rita pledged allegiance to the flag, listened to Frank Sinatra records, ate hamburgers and hot dogs, and joined the Girl Scouts. And her parents also did their best to adjust to the new circumstances. Um, so within a year of arriving in New York City, Rita's mother had found work as a librarian at Columbia University and achieved fluency in English. Um, Rita's father continued to work as a political journalist, writing for a Czech language exile publication, a really important one, called Listy, under his new pen name, Stanislav Budin. Um, so by the end of the Second World, um, Rita too was conducting all of her correspondence entirely in fluent idiomatic English. This would be really important for later in our story. So like her father, she's sort of becoming already at a young age and a kind of interpreter between worlds. Um, and you can read her letters and from this era and she has to explain all these things about what's happening in Europe to her sort of American classmates. Um, this is just one thing I found in the archive that I think captures my point well. So in this page ripped from her childhood notebook, um, Rita doodled the American and Czech flag side by side and signed her name in two languages. Of course, um, after the war, Rita's American idol came to an end. And in 1946, the Budin family finally returned to Czechoslovakia. Um, they reestablished re themselves in Prague and the Bach family now legally changed their surname to Budin. And Rata Bachova became Rita Budinova, not, not the first or last of her name changes. Um, I should mention that this was common in post war Central Europe, right? Um, it, uh, a lot of Jewish families changed their last names. So did German families with uh, German surnames. So um, this is under, should be understood in a larger context of the era. Um, this, this, this is also the era when Stanislav Budin rejoins the Communist Party. So that's her father. Um, and um, his, uh, her mother actually will start finding really stimulating work as a translator because she knows English so well. So over the next decade or so, she'll translate um, incredible roster of American writers, especially dramatists. So Lorraine Hansberry, Lillian Hellman, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, and also James Baldwin um, later on. Um, now Rita herself, um, she'd been more reluctant to return to Prague, um, but she ended up completing her high school um, at the British International School. Um, and um, despite being back in England, in Czechoslovakia, she continued to sort of write notes to her parents in English. Um, then the Communist Party right takes over in 1948, and Rita, her her family, right? They're they're um they're they've been active members of the left for for more than a decade. They enthusiastically throw themselves into the project of building a socialist state in Czechoslovakia, at least initially. So um, Rita herself had been a member of the Communist Party since before 1948, and in the 1950s she got a doctorate in economics, um, and she wrote. Uh, sort of Marxist inflected dissertation on the US economy during the Great Depression. Um, her name changed yet again during this era, um, this time to Rita Linarzova after she married an ambitious young party member and lawyer named Stjenek Linarz, who had recently graduated from Moscow State University. Just a note on her first husband. So um, Linarz, um, when he was in Moscow, his roommate was a fellow student and leader um, named Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, so the two rising figures would remain really lifelong friends. In fact, Perestroika and Glasnost were influenced by um, uh, Gorbachev's relationship with Linaj. Um, of course, I'm getting ahead of the story, but in the 1980s, when Rita will be a dissident, she would brag that she was the only Czech dissident who knew Gorbachev's waste measurements. Um, so uh, let's go back to the Prague Spring. Um, so um, uh, Rita's husband, Zdenek Minaj, would ascend to the Central Committee of the Communist Party um, and help uh, craft um, Alexander Dubček's reform program, um, a set of sort of liberal policies that attempted to realize the popular ideal um, of so-called socialism with a human face. 
Now, Rita's own views shifted over the course of the 60s. She spent the decade teaching economics at Charles University. And although she separated from her husband in 1967, she too embraced the uh, cause of, um, of reformed communism and became a leading voice for economic liberalization during the Prague Spring. After the Soviet-led invasion in August of 1968, and the establishment of a new regime of so-called normalization, Rita was expelled from the Communist Party. Um, in fact, her entire department was purged. So she'd have to find a series of odd jobs, including working at an auto automat, um, and eventually she would sort of uh, supplement her income by working as a technical translator because of her English language skills. And despite all these challenge challenges, or more precisely in my view, because of them, she would soon once again be put in a position to help mediate between Czech and American cultural worlds. The American novelist Philip Roth uh, first traveled to Prague with his companion Barbara Sproul in 1972 and fell in love with the Bohemian capital. And one of the first people he was put in touch with was Rita, in large part because she spoke fluent English. And it was Rita who first introduced Roth to banned Czech writers like Milan Kundera, Ludwig Fazulik, and Ivan Klima a Jew Jewish survivor of the Kerstin concentration camp who would become Roth's primary guide in Prague. The Czechoslovak secret police, um, known as the FKB, um, were now paying much closer attention to Roth's activities in Prague. And when you read his file, um, when I translated it, um, they were very concerned about the fact that he was meeting with the Budin family and uh, with uh, Stanislav and his daughter Rita, um, who were considered hostile intellectuals and here I'm um, quoting, um, tangentious and anti-socialist materials were being circulated abroad by this family. Um, uh, of course, uh, it should—it was not uh, incidental that um, their secret, their, what they called their reasonable suspicion of this family had to do with the fact that they were Jewish. Um, at several points, Roth's secret police file re uh, re uh, references, quote, suspected enemy activity in cooperation with foreign Zionist centers. Um, so, it was also during Roth's second visit to Prague a year later that he first learned about the existence of a Czech writer named Jerzy Weil. And at the start of the 1970s, I should say, Weil was still almost entirely unknown in the English speaking world. After returning home, Roth sought out more information about Weil, um, but he could only find a few scattered references. And one of the only places he could find information about Vial was from this book called The Jews of Czechoslovakia, um, which referred to the life of the stars, the outstanding Czech book published between 1945 and 1948. Um, years later, I should mention Roth would quote this in his preface to the novel. Um, I just want to pause here and say a word about this book. Um, it's because it's actually a really interesting example and also a product of the movement of Jewish people and text across Cold War boundaries. So the book was this ambitious three volume project completed by an exiled uh, sort of society for the history of Czechoslovak Jews founded in um, New York City in 1961. Um, and many of the contributors were themselves Jewish emigres from Czechoslovakia who had fled from either Nazism or a decade later communism. So uh, all these sort of chapters draw, they're really interesting. They draw on personal testimony and also like printed sources, family, documents that were smuggled out of Czechoslovakia. Um, what's interesting is, though, is that the project presents the history of Jews in the Czech lands as a closed story, right? This is all retrospective. And ironically enough, this book actually helped keep the story alive by connecting um, American Jewish writers and readers like Roth um, with, uh, with figures like Klimova, who um, remained in Prague after the Second World War. Um, there's a really great new book, um, if anybody's interested in learning more about sort of the history of Jews in the Bohemian lands, um, that I think really puts this well. Um, if you're interested, I can, you can email me and I can send you a link uh, to, to, the, to the name of the book. Um, but the quote that, from the book that I like, um, a focus on a perceived glorious past when the Bohemian lands, especially Prague, served as a cultural center of European Jews was intended to help contemporary Jews to envision a cultural richness and to strengthen the regional ties. Such identification remained even more relevant in exile, right? So I think what I'm trying to suggest is that figures like this, well, texts like this book, but figures like Rita Klimova really helped bridge these two worlds. 
as well as the past and present. Um, and by working together, Rita and Philip Roth would also help keep the story of the forgotten writer, Yerji Vial, alive as well. So at one point in Life with the Star, Vial's protagonist tells his only companion, who is a stray cat, it's clear you were born under an unlucky star. Vial himself was born in Pravkolesti in central Bohemia in the year 1900. He was raised in a family of Jewish shop owners um, and then moved to Prague after the First World War. His first visit, um, he, first, he first visited post-revolutionary Russia in 1922, and within two years, he had joined the Communist Party. His decision to learn the Russian language, though, was literary as well as political. Um, his taste ran to avant-garde literature, but he was very interested in the Russian classics. Um, he wrote a dissertation on Gogol, um, and uh, because of his language skills, uh, he was invited to Moscow again in 1933 as a translator for the Communist International. However, by 1935, he had run afoul of Soviet officials and was kicked out of the Communist Party and sent for re-education, first in Kyrgyzstan and later in Kazakhstan. Um, Vile subsequent disillusionment with the Soviet pro project is reflected in his first novel, Moskva Kranitsa, which is Moscow Border, published in 1937 and published upon his return to Prague. Um, I think I just heard that this is about to be translated into English and I can't wait. Um, I'm going to tell everybody to go out and get it. Um, the sequel, um, The Wooden Spoon, which drew on his experiences in Kazakhstan, um, wouldn't be published until after the Velvet Revolution. Unlike Rita's family, um, during the Second World War, Vile chose to remain in Prague. And so Life with the Star isn't, it's, it, it's too simple to call it an autobiographical novel, but it did draw um, directly on his experiences during the Nazi occupation. Uh, the narrative commences after uh, Josef Robichak, a former bank clerk, has already decided not to emigrate. Indeed, this fateful decision is obsessed over by Joseph, Josef in retrospect, and it becomes a major theme of the novel. Quote, I was afraid to cross the border. I would not have known what to do in a foreign country, Josef confesses. Over the course of the novel, he comes to regret his own passivity. Quote, all I did was wait pointlessly, end quote, and the moment passed, end quote. Um, so um, this is sort of the starting point of the novel. And for both Vile and his fictional protagonist, regret would spur other fateful decisions. Vile soon married Olga Frenslova, a non-Jew, which offered him a measure of protection. For a time, he was able to avoid being called up for the transports. His immediate family was not fortunate. His parents and sister were deported to Auschwitz and Treblinka in October 1942. His brother would be shot during the Prague uprising of 1945. Vile's own mixed marriage only protected him for so long. In the summer of 1943, Vile was assigned work at the Central Jewish Museum in Prague where he worked up until January of 1945, when mixed Jewish marriages were finally annulled by the protectorate authorities. In February of 1945, his name was finally called for deportation to Teresin, the old fortress city the Germans referred to as Theresienstadt. However, rather than report to the grounds of the Trade Fair Palace, where thousands of Jews were processed before deportation, Weil did something dramatic. He faked his own suicide by jumping into the Vltava River. He then went into hiding on the outskirts of Prague for the remainder of the occupation. At the time of the Nazi defeat in May of 1945, he weighed less than 100 pounds. Vile was one of only an estimated 14,000 Jews still alive in the Czech lands after the end of the war. And Vile actually began writing Life with the Star as a first person memoir while he was still in hiding at the end of the war. And although no specific dates are provided, in the narrative, Viles describes the effects of Nazi policies instituted in the years 1940 to 1942. So that's roughly the time frame covered in the novel. And this was the period of escalating repression when the protectorate forced the Jewish religious community, referred to only as the community in the novel, to administer new rounds, property confiscations, evictions, and restrictions on mobility, making the daily life of Prague's remaining Jews nearly impossible 
After September 1st, 1941, Jews were also required to wear a yellow star on, sewn, with, uh, sewn on their chest. And later the same month, um, Reinhard Heydrich took over the administration of the protectorate and declared martial law. The next few years saw market escalation, acceleration in arrests, mass killings, and deportations to Teresina and death camps. And I want to emphasize that it, you know, you can piece together um, sort of the real historical events that are in the background of the novel, but they're never explicitly referenced, right? We get this really a ground level view of what's happening. Um, so early in the novel, Yosef responds to all these new policies with a kind of almost exaggerated, detached resignation choosing to live an anonymous and isolated existence in the outskirts of Prague. But then the community assigns some manual labor, um, ultimately as a part of a crew in a cemetery. And Yosef slowly begins to rediscover his own dignity through the camaraderie of work. Now, here I really wanna emphasize, um, Life of the Star is not a heroic tale of individual survival. It's an anti-heroic novel about the surrealism of hope under impossible conditions. And in this respect, Bile's novel bears a family resemblance to the fictions of another bohemian Jewish writer, Franz Kafka. And they really, he really was an admirer of Kafka and there's a reference to Kafka early in the book. Um, but there's, at the same time, there's really this, a really crucial difference between Kafka and Vile. For Vile, hopelessness is also a precondition of solidarity and resistance. In other words, so there's this quote in the novel, if it were not for hope, he writes, one would probably fight. So it's a paradoxical idea. Um, Vile's own decision to go into hiding also made his experience far from typical. Um, according to an estimate later provided by Stanislav Budin, Vile was one of only a few hundred um, Czech Jews who survived the Nazi occupation by going underground. And this actually made the novel a little bit controversial when it was first published among um, the remaining Jewish community who felt that this novel didn't represent their experience um, or the experience of their community or their families. Um, the novel was finally published in 1949, as I mentioned, a year after the Communist Party's takeover. And within a few months, the novel was removed from bookshelves. Um, a year later, as I mentioned also, Vile would be expelled from the Czechoslovak Writers' Union, which under the Communist Party rule of the time meant it was nearly impossible for him to work as a writer. The official attack on the novel um, was spearheaded by this hardline critic named Ivan Skala. Um, and it was a really major, it was sort of a uh, uh, really influential attack and review. Um, Vile was accused of, quote, reactionary bourgeois ideology, um, cowardly defeatism, and perhaps most unsurprisingly, cosmopolitanism, right? Which is Jewish coded in this context. Um, now, I want to point out, you know, because the novel was banned and uh, I think then celebrated in the United States decades later, sometimes people have the sort of misapprehension that this is somehow an anti-communist novel. Um, but what I think is really interesting about it is that it shows how flexible socialist realism was as a literary category um, in the 1940s. And this is something that neither Communist Party ideologues or Western critics would have liked to believe. And what I mean here is that it was really a novel of its time, combining elements of post-war existentialism and the Kafkaesque with older left-wing values. In particular, the novel affirms a version of courage that is only made possible through work and solidarity. Um, in particular, Yosef's decision to go underground at the end of the novel is enabled by his friendship with the Czech laborer um, who it is implied as a member of a communist resistance group. Um, so it might even seem surprising that it was banned in that context. Uh, but there was one other review that was sort of the final nail in the coffin. And um, in this review, um, the accusation was that the novel amounted to a distortion of social reality. Um, and this particular line of criticism appeared in a leading magazine called Cultural Politics. As it turns out, this magazine was edited by Rita Klimova's father, Stanislav Budin. And the author of the attack on Vile was Rita's mother, Anna Budinova. This will be really important later in the story. <laughs> 
Banned from publishing, Weil once again took refuge at the Jewish Museum in Prague, where he had been assigned work during the Nazi occupation. And even if his second career as a librarian at the Jewish Museum was born of necessity, Weil was now preoccupied with Jewish themes in his writing. After the publication of Life of the Star and the subsequent backlash, Weil committed himself to preserving the experience of Czech Jews during the Second World War in all his work. At the museum, he helped to create a very famous exhibition of children's drawings from Terrasin. So if any of you have visited um, the incredible um, Jewish Museum in Prague, uh, it's a multi-site, multi-synagogue um, uh, institution, you can still see these drawings on display. Um, he also collaborated on a related book called I Have Not Seen a Butterfly Around Here, um, which featured these drawings and was released in four languages upon its publication. It was a really big deal at the time in the late 50s. And an exhibi this exhibition based on the book um, actually traveled abroad in 1956. And Vile was allowed to visit Paris, leaving Czechoslovakia for the final time in his own lifetime. Um, so in 1958, Vile also published a really interesting experimental prose poem called Lamentation for 77,297 Victims that layered personal anecdotes and biblical quotations over historical, historical accounts of the Holocaust in the Czech lands. Um, this was recently published in English, so you can go and, and order this and read it if you're interested. Um, the book was intended to accompany uh, a new memorial being installed at the Pincus Synagogue in Prague, which was not open to the public until 1960. Um, this was one year too late for Jerzy Weil. Um, he didn't live to see the reopening of the synagogue because he had died a year earlier in 1959 um, from leukemia. Okay, um, so we're kind of entering the final um, sort of part of the story. So we're gonna return to the 1970s. After learning um, more about Weil uh, and reading the few stories already translated in English, Philip Roth approached Rita in Prague and asked if she'd be interested in completing an English translation of Life with the Star. Um, and they started talking about the idea, but their plans were interrupted before they could get started. In 1976, Roth's adventures in Czechoslovakia came to an abrupt end. Um, I, I think I told the story in my last lecture, so I'll, I'll, I'll do, do it really quickly. Um, all of a sudden he noticed um, uniformed policemen approaching him on a street corner in Prague. And usually he was used to seeing the sort of undercover policemen following him, but this was new. So he panicked and he jumped on a path in the tram and escaped um, sort of questioning, uh, changed his travel plans, flew back to the United States and he was never allowed back in Prague again until after 1989. Um, now, uh, Roth didn't, was hoping he could come back sooner. So he wrote this letter um, to Klimova um, that I found in the archives in which he says, quote, please tell all my friends that I am on the way, more or less, that they are on my mind often, that I follow their adventures as, this, as they sift through me. And, that I have not deserted them. Um, so um, back in Prague, theme of us own risky activities were just getting started. Uh, so her father, Stanislav Budin, um, had been retired um, since 69, and he actually um, ends up becoming one of the first signatories of the Charter 77 Manifesto, a really important document that led, sort of began the human rights movement in Czechoslovakia. Um, so after her father signed the charter, Klimova found that she could no longer get work as a technical translator, um, but she did get married again in 1978 to Stena Klima, um, and that's when she changed her name for the final time to Rita Klimova. Um, however, um, by 1980, um, both her parents had passed away, and her new husband also died, um, surprisingly. Um, so for a time, um, Rita was sort of in mourning and trying to stay out of trouble, um, and one of the reasons, and this is really poignant to me, is she really hoped that she could get travel permission to go and visit the United States one more time, the place that she loved so much in her girlhood. Of course, um, Rita was never one to stay out of trouble. Um, so she, by the mid 1980s, would become a prominent dissident herself. First, she helped her son Vladimir 
um, here she is, by the way, in the 1980s with her two sons. He would help um, her son Vladimir distribute underground manuscripts out of their Prague apartment. Um, and then she began writing her own Samistat articles on economic topics under the pseudonym Adam Kovach, um, which is sort of the Czech language equivalent to Adam Smith. Because of her connections in the English speaking world, she also became the first point of contact for US based human rights activists. This, there's so much actually to this kind of period in her life. Um, if anybody wants to hear more about it during Korea, please ask. But I just want to share one long quotation from this book from um, Jerry Labor, one of the founders of um, Helsinki Watch and what became Human Rights Watch about when she first traveled to Prague um, and was supposed to have a meeting um, right, with her Czech counterpart. Um, here's what she writes. I climbed a dark staircase and rang the apartment bell. The door opened immediately. A flood of light spilled out into the shadowy hallway, framing a short, stocky, round-faced woman with thick reddish hair, an engaging smile, and a decidedly New York accent. You're Jerry. Hi, I'm Rita. Come on in. And then uh, Jerry thinks to herself, well, I'm not the only American in Prague. And she couldn't figure out who this person was. Was shocked to find out it was her Czech contact. And you hear these stories from lots of other people. Like Roth was like, what's, what's this New Yorker doing in Prague in 1972? Um, before they found out her story. Um, so despite all um, these sort of new dissident activities, Klimova had not forgotten about life with the star. Um, and so this is actually the next document is actually where I first started figuring this whole story out. So I found this um, note, um, which I'll read in a moment, um, some of the key points um, in Roth's archive when I was working on my book. So in 1985, Roth receives an unexpected package from Klimova in the mail. And she writes, if you remember, you suggested I try to translate from Czech into English the novel by Yuzhi Vaya, Life with a Star, which somebody told you was good. So he, this is wild to me. So like they haven't really been in much contact for years. And out of the blue, without any promise that it would be published, any contract, anything like that, she just sends Roth the translation. Um, so she sends the manuscript with her notes, a copy of the Czech original, and then um, she apologizes uh, for the long delay, explaining, I started the translation immediately after you left, but then I was sick, then I got married, we reconstructed the summer cottage we bought, and especially after 1977, the charter, too much was happening. Besides, I had a living to make, so after 50 pages, I quit, but she didn't quit for long. Um, so. The other cool thing about this document is that she proposes this coded system so Roth can tell her whether there's any shot this will be published. So basically he said, she says, send me back a postcard and you can give me one of three responses. I see it, you can see it in the lower box there. A, greetings from you, wherever you happen to be equals confirmation, right? You receive the manuscript and you look at it um, all the way down to C, right? Um, Right, or B is like, you're not interested. It's been a lousy year, you've been sick. Um, and then C is, this has been a good year. And that means, yeah, there's a great chance we'll publish it. Um, so uh, I don't have Roth's postcard that he sent back, but I assume it was C because the novel um, ends up being published just a few years later. Um, now, when I first saw this document, I was thought the kind of coded system was so cool. I didn't even notice something else buried in the letter. But after researching the full story, I finally understood the significance. So um, what I discovered was that um, sort of later in the letter, Rita says to Roth, there's one more thing I should mention. Among those who wrote very negative reviews of Vile's book on ideological grounds was my mother in 1949 in a journal called Cultural Politics. So right, this is one of those attacks that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, that led to the banning of the novel and his files of expulsion from the writers' union. And so Klimova adds, I would very much like to think, here's the quote, I would very much like to think that I have contributed to setting, contributed to setting things right by mediating a wider audience for Vile. So um, when Life with the Star was finally published in English in June of 1989, um, Rita also asked Roth, to omit her name as translator. Um, one, she wasn't someone to always take credit for things, but I think she also didn't want to compromise all the important work she was doing as a dissident in Prague. Um, as Roth would later say in an interview, 
Rita never said anything. She just did it. And it was wonderful, a truly classic book. She did it. So we're nearing the end of my talk, um, but Rita's story is hardly over with the publication of this novel. In the fall of 1989, Rita had her hands full once again. Uh, she wrote to Roth in a letter, there's a strange tension here, almost an island of tranquility, which is getting on everyone's nerves. On November 17th, eight days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a large crowd of students filled Prague's Wenceslas Square and were soon joined by a half million of their fellow Czechoslovak citizens. And within two days, Václav Havel had helped establish a dissident coalition called the Civic Forum, which began negotiating with the communist government for a peaceful transition to free and democratic elections. Now, this, here's how this intersects with our story. Havel surprised Klimova by recruiting her to serve as the English language interpreter for the Civic Forum. As Jerry Labor put it, Rita would become the English language voice of the revolution, telling the outside world what was happening, interpreting for Václav Havel as he rushed into power. And although she would characteristically deny credit, Klimova helped popularize the English language phrase that is still used to describe Czechoslovakia's democratic transition, the Velvet Revolution. So it appears she came up with this phrase that we all use. In February of 1990, Havel appointed Klimova as Czechoslovakia's first post-communist ambassador to the United States. And she moved to Washington, DC. Her skills as a mediator between worlds was, were more useful than ever. Um, unfortunately, after assuming her post in DC, Klimova was diagnosed with cancer. She continued to work tires, tirelessly until she finally stepped down in the summer of 1992. Rita Klimova died in Prague on December 30th, 1993 at age 62, struck down by leukemia, the same disease that had killed Yezhivaya. A week after Klimova's death, Roth wrote a letter to the New York Times. So the New York Times published a really nice obituary that captured the kind of dramatic um, arc of Klimova's life, um, but they missed one thing. The Roth wrote a letter to the New York Times that was published two weeks later. And what he wanted them to know is that in addition to all her public accomplishments, she had been the secret, also been the secret translator of Life with the Star. Here's what Roth writes. At the time the manuscript was being prepared for publication, it would have been politically dangerous for Mrs. Klimova to take credit for the translation. So the name that appears on the title page, along with Rosalind Schlaff, is a pseudonym Mrs. Klimova chose, Rosanna Kovarikova. But it was Rita Klimova who, with all her other brave and valuable accomplishments, introduced Files' remarkable novel to the United States. Her name was no longer hidden behind a star. And thanks to her courageous efforts, Yuri Vile's most important novel was also finally out of hiding. Now it's up to all of you and all of us to go out and read it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. This was so fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I'm dying to ask. Let me begin with a question and then we'll see what we have. If you can look at the Q&A sure. so you can see of course. questions that are available. I only see one there. So let me pose a question to you. Uh, what exactly does Jewishness mean? Uh, first to Rita and especially to her parents uh, and, and the father is really kind of intriguing here. So yeah. if you can say about that, uh, something about that and also no less complicated is the Jewishness of Yeri, uh, Yuji, uh, who is, um, you know, made his decisions to, to, uh, uh, to intermarry in order to save himself. That's all understandable. But uh, I kind of need to get a sense of what is the Jewish identity of these people. Yeah, right. So um, can, can we I start get with you? rid of the, uh, yeah, it's, we see a lot on the screen. If you can, yeah. Much there we better. go. Yeah, thank you. Um, great question, Hava. Um, and what makes this challenging is it's not always something that they speak about, right? Especially in the sources that I have, but there are some useful exceptions. 
So the really interesting thing, can I start with Yirji Bile? Um, because I think this is particularly interesting. Um, so, you know, like a lot of left-wing writers of Jewish ancestry during this period, right, there is a kind of rejection or at least a turn away from their own kind of Jewish religious upbringing. Um, and you see this in a lot of his early writing, which sort of doesn't address Jewish themes in any substantive way, right? His first novel is a political novel um, about you know, his experiences um, when he went to the Soviet Union. Then of course you have Life of the Star that comes out after the war, which is in some ways you could say, you know, a vision of Jewishness defined by persecution and the policies of the Nazi protectorate. Um, there's the curious feature of the novel that I mentioned where, right, Jewishness as the word itself is not included, right? It's always they, it's, you know, um, uh, the, the particulars are, are kind of omitted from the novel. Um, so Jewishness as a subject, as a theme, even as a term is not in his earlier writing. But then it's really after he's banned as a writer and he starts to work for the second time at the Jewish Museum, now the State Jewish Museum in Prague, that his work um, turns to, as a librarian, to sort of cataloging the incredible um, collection that had been recovered from the war, but also doing sort of these kind of um, missions to preservation missions, um, traveling to Teresin to collect um, whatever documents that he can save for the Jewish Museum, he suddenly, there's a turn, right? And suddenly Jewishness is now central to who he is as a writer, uh, as a, now a historian, right? An archivist um, and as a librarian. And so everything that he writes after that, um, it becomes a much more explicit and important to him. Um, so he, I didn't mention this because there wasn't a lot of time, but he publishes another novel later called Mendelssohn on the Roof that was later translated into English in the early nineties. That's really, really interesting. Um, uh, and it's based really takes these anecdotes he's heard from other people um, and their experiences in the same period of life of the star. But the, the you know, the Jewishness is explicit in that novel. Um, and then later, Lamentation, which I mentioned, this sort of very complicated poem is also deeply religious, probably his most religious um, piece of writing. And it's the, the last thing he writes before he dies. So there's a really interesting arc that you see with uh, Vile. Um, now, uh, with, with Boudin, um, it's a little different for him. You see that like he kind of, um, you know, there was an interesting Czech, bio Czech language biography about him that, that sort of argues that like for him, it was always political ideology, right? He was a political writer. And for him, that had to do mostly with his shifting relationship to communism, right? From going being a sort of doctrinaire communist in his younger years to being kind of an anti-Stalinist, being kind of an enthusiastic builder of state socialism to finally be signing the, being a sort of reformed communist, signing the charter in the seventies. So Jewishness is much less explicitly important to him. I think actually for, um, for Rita, it's actually, you know, this, this is, this is where, you know, the sources are a little bit more quiet on the subject, but you can read between the lines because the relationships what what I what I what one thing one of the sort of puzzles in all my research I wanted to understand is why were the forms of solidarity between um, Jewish writers in the United States and Jewish intellectuals and activists and, and dissidents in Prague the ones that mattered the most that were the strongest ties right despite having these very different kind of living in um, um, working in such different contexts so I think that their shared Jewish background and their interest in the experience of sort of Jewish history in the middle of the 20th century ends up creating this sort of bridge and allows them to communicate across the boundaries of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds great. Let's see, you've got five questions, I see. Great, you I love I. it. So uh, if you're able to look at them. Yeah, I mean why don't I start okay. at the top and I'll read the question out loud and then I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to answer and let's get to as many as we can. Um, so the first says, uh, an Amazon reviewer from the UK says Mendelssohn on the, is on the roof is as good or better than Life with a Star comments. Um, I know some people think that. Uh, interestingly, I like Life with a Star more, uh, but you know, sometimes this is the confession of a scholar. 
I think that's because it's, a, I find it to be the puzzle of some of the choices that Vile makes in that um, book, like the, the, the non-specifics and the kind of existentialist Kafkaesque element fused with what I describe as sort of a experimental form of socialist realism. Like it's a really unusual book um, and it sort of makes it stand out on its own. So I really love it for that reason. Mendelssohn on the Roof um, uh, is in some ways, I think, uh, probably a friendlier read. Um, the There's a certain kind of humor to the anecdotes, a dark humor, obviously, um, including on the title, right? The title refers um, to the story that went around in Prague about um, the, the, the sort of the, you know, um, uh, a Nazi officer saying, looking at the opera house, uh, uh, not the opera house, the concert hall, um, and looking at the roof and saying, Remove the remove the statue of Mendelssohn um, immediately, um, but they can't figure out which one is Mendelssohn, and and uh, they're trying to judge which one it is based on the size of the noses on the statues, and like it, it becomes this sort of absurd um, exercise. Um, and so, like, there's there, there's a there's a lot going on in that text. It's really worth reading. I mean, my honest answer is read both. Um, there's also some of his short stories that appeared in English in 1972 that are really interesting. Um, there's lots to read, honestly, and more coming, more translations on the way. So, uh, you know, I would say don't stop at one. Um, next question. So are there dis uh, discussion questions for book groups for Life with a Star? Is it in paperback and in libraries? Yeah, you can find copies. It's on Amazon. You can get a copy on Amazon and libraries usually have a copy. You know, it's interesting. It's like, I, I think most people don't remember this book now um, in 2024, but I think in the early 90s, it really made a splash. Um, um, so, you know, libraries often have copies and I think they put out a new paperback edition relatively. I know they just made a new paperback edition of Mendelssohn is on the Roof. Um, so as for discussion questions, that's a great, great, uh, great point. But if you pull together a reading group, I'm more than happy to put together some discussion questions so we can, we can figure something out. Um, well, next question, why did Rita write translator's note? Um, um, why did, why was that sort of in spite of the writer's intentions? Well, I actually disagree with Ann Tyler on this. I mean, I think you, you can't take for granted that all that context would have been understood by an American reader. Um, especially like what the community refers to, which is so important in the novel, right? You could probably figure out that they meant the Nazi occupiers, but maybe you couldn't even take that for granted, right? I don't know, an American reader in um, 1990 or 1989 didn't necessarily understand why the experience of Czech Jews was so unusual um, because of the sort of, uh, the, the sort of early invasion um, of an occupation by the Nazis. And, you know, sometimes Prague was referred to as a ghetto without walls. Uh, so there's sort of, you know, it's, it's unusual based compared to some, some narratives you get from other kind of uh, countries in the region during the same period. Um, so, you know, but I think that the idea was that like, and this is really interesting to me, like people wanted to read this book in the United States in the nineties as a kind of universal fable. And I think that says something really interesting about like what the larger, wider population in the United States wanted out of stories about the Holocaust, right? They wanted them to be allegories or universal fables. They wanted to be able to draw lessons that could be applied to other groups. And I think that, you know, there's been a really kind of lively um, disagreement about whether that is something we should be looking for in these kinds of stories, whether, um, you know, um, uh, the, whether we should read a novel as a form of sort of documentary history or something else. Um, so I think it's an interesting question and that's why I opened with it. Um, so next, um, I recently reheard of Philip Roth on an episode of the show, Girls on Philip HBO Max. Yes, I know the episode you're talking about. Um, Lena Dunham's character mentioned something about his misogyny. Did Rita Klimova ever find Mr. Roth misogynistic? Thank you for asking this question. This is actually something I've been, um, I'm wanting to write a lot more about um, recently. So I'll just mention that, um, so um, uh, when I went to Prague to research my book, one of the most exciting moments was when I got to interview a Czech uh, Jewish writer named Ivan Klima and his wife, Helena Klimova. Um, really fascinating, important people who are close friends with Rita Klimova. Um, there's not, they're not related, they have the same last name. Um, and uh, they were really close with Roth. 
Um, and so I was like asking, confirming all these things for my story, uh, for my book. And I said, finally, I said, I have to ask, you know, in the United States, Roth is probably best known as a misogynist. Like, can you reflect on this from your own perspective? Um, and it was interesting. So Helen Klimova, uh, uh, she got very serious and she said, look, um, I will defend Roth till the day I die um, in my own personal kind of dealings with him. Um, uh, I disagree with the sort of American critics, um, but uh, Milan Kundera, his friend is a misogynist. And we got in this whole side conversation about it. So, I mean, I'm really interested in the kind of question of misogyny. Czech dissident culture um, was famously chauvinistic. I mean, that's one reason Rita Klimova's story was so unknown for so many people for so long. It was the famous male dissidents and writers that everybody had heard of. Um, the question of Roth's misogyny, maybe that'll give another lecture that Havel let me give, because I'm really interested in this question. In my own classes, I always teach his novels alongside essays by Vivian Gornick, and we have a really lively conversation about that subject. So if you want more, uh, read Vivian Gornick on Roth. Okay, next. Uh, Let's see, could you talk some more, oops, yeah, about Vile's relationship with Kafka? Did they ever do any writing together? Um, no, so like they barely overlapped. So Kafka dies in 1924 um, and uh, right, so Vile had been in the 20s, right, traveling to the Soviet Union. I mean, you know, they, they, it's a small world, the Prague Jewish literary culture. So. They kind of know of each other, but there's an important difference between the two of them culturally, which is that um, Kafka is, a, you know, he's, he's part of the German language Jewish community. And there's a lot of overlap, right? But um, Vile is, is a Czech speaker. Um, and Kafka also knew Czech and could read Czech. So there's, you know, it's not like this is a, a, a you know, a, a wall that you can't cross. But um, I think it's more actually that in retrospect, Vile was one of the few um, Czech writers who really learned and admired from Kafka during this period. Because, um, you know, one thing I do write about in my book quite a, at quite a great length is that Kafka um, was largely forgotten um, after his death in Czechoslovakia, except for certain sort of idiosyncratic groups of writers, the avant-garde. Um, uh, there's one interesting story that um, um, Kafka's uh, uh, translator, the person who translated Kafka's novels into Czech, um, Paul Eisner, um, was uh, another Jew who went into hiding like Vile during the war. So they all knew each other. Um, so the people who kind of kept Kafka's memory alive after his death, I think, did all know each other and collaborate. And, were, um, and so Vile was one of these people. Um, uh, the next is, I would recommend that Mendelssohn is on the roof. Not necessarily a question, but read both. Yes, I agree, Gerald. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, it is really, really a, an interesting novel. Um, uh, and then, oh, then, then Lita says, Hava, can we please do an episode about Philip Roth and misogyny, please? <laughs> I love it. Well, if, uh, even if I... it's not a, through Jewish studies, I, I can arrange one, a clandestine um, lecture for us. No, no, I, I think actually the issue of uh, gender gender and Jewish literature could be a good way of putting oh, yeah. together a lot of it, not just misogyny, gender is not just a button to understand. No, absolutely. I mean, the term I use in my book to describe sort of this dynamic is dissident masculinity. So it's sort of like this form of masculinity that is politically radical, um, sexually radical, but also has a strong sort of failure of imagination when it comes to thinking about female experience, right? So, you know, um, yeah, it's an interesting topic to say the least. Uh, could you comment actually on, uh, cause I really know nothing about what's going on in the Czech Republic, but what is the strength or weakness of the Jewish voice today? Are they kind of identifiable presence in this intellectual life or yeah. marginal or what is it? It's very small. Um, there was an interesting moment when the U.S. ambassador to Prague was uh, a Jewish man. And so, like, they brought together, like, this interesting, like, you could go hang out and, you know, there was, it was a sort of open invitation. 
to go hang out in the small sort of uh, Jewish community if you were an American expat hanging out in Prague. But um, in general, it's quite small. Um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Czech Jews are assimilated, you know, the, who are who are in Prague now. Um, you know, some of my younger friends, for instance, are fully, who are, who are Jewish or seem to be fully assimilated and have maybe not the strongest relationship to the kind of what is referred to as the Jewish community. That's the phrase that they're officially known as because they're sort of institutionally organized still. Um, but I mean, you know, uh, I think that the, the, the sort of, for anybody who's visited Prague will probably be able to kind of back me up on this, the, the sort of the, the Jewish museum complex is absolutely remarkable. Um, it has the sort of oldest sort of intact synagogue in Europe um, as just one of its many sites. And uh, so I think as a center of sort of Jewish culture for learning about Jewish culture in Europe, um, it's an incredibly important city. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's the sort of, it, it, as sort of a active intellectual force in the literary culture now, not so much. Um, but certainly I think in terms of its own self-identity, right? There's a really interesting, you know, even non-Jewish Czechs, especially those who are kind of in the tradition of the distant underground culture still look to that as a model. The dissident underground conceived of itself, the, 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 one of my old, my old Czech teacher at Harvard, um, Veronica Tokorova writes about this, um, that they conceived of themselves as a merry ghetto. And they used the, the, the sort of image of the ghetto um, and really actively in part because they were obsessed with Kafka um, and sort of the, the image of sort of Jewish Prague um, from the pre-war era was really important symbolically to them. Um, so, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, Prague Jewish literary culture lives on, it's sort of been an important part of, of Czech literary culture to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have got two more questions. Oh, great. Um, what are you working on now? Um, okay, so I've got like a larger project, you know, first book's done, got to apply for tenure, see what happens. Um, I am publishing a version, a chapter on this for a volume on called Contact that's about the movement of Jewish people and artifacts across Cold War boundaries. So that's finishing up. The next thing I'm doing is, I don't know what it's going to be yet, um, whether it's going to be, you know, what the end product will be, but my, um, so in my own family background, my Jewish side is my, is on my, is patrilineal. And it's my, my, so I, my, my grandfather was during the war was second world war, um, was stationed in Trinidad of all places. Um, and recently I was handed, uh, 500 letters from Trinidad during the war. And I scanned them all at ASU library and read them and they're absolutely remarkable. Um, and uh, so I've gotten really interested in the experience of sort of my grandfather in Trinidad during the second world war. So during spring break for my 40th birthday present to myself, I'm going to Trinidad. I'm gonna go <laughs> see all these places um, and maybe write something about it. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a personal story, but I've gotten really interested in, in the cultural aspects of this because this is the moment of imperial handover, uh, sort of this is when the British Empire, um, you know, uh, gives some of its land to the U.S. in exchange for submarines um, and the U.S. establishes bases on Trinidad, um, naval bases during the war, um, and soon Trinidad will become independent. An incredible sort of group of intellectuals and writers emerged during this period. If you know anything about Calypso music, this is when steel pan music is sort of invented. My my grandfather was a great musician, so he writes all about sort of the rise of this kind of new form of Calypso music. Um, so it's an incredibly culturally rich moment. And so um, it's something completely different. It's what I'm gonna look at for a little while. But I'm, I'm also interested actually in maybe returning to this period we're talking about and thinking about sort of dissident um, literary culture in a much broader transnational sense, the role of American publishers um, in that story, um, you know, thinking beyond just the U.S. and Czechoslovakia and thinking a little bit more broadly about that story. I'm really interested in, in writing something about that. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, how did Vile survive in hiding? Did somebody help him? Um, yeah, I think he did have some help, uh, but uh, I mean, I should say he barely survived. I mean, it was only a few months he had to make it. And, you know, as I mentioned, he was, you know, a hundred pounds at the end of the war. So he nearly starved, um, you know, cause he was really in hiding. Um, so yeah, I, he did have, he just still knew people, um, right. Um, he was still married to uh, a non-Jew, uh, but they all had to pretend he was dead um, to sort of um, avoid sort of any additional scrutiny. But it's really remarkable and unusual, extremely unusual. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, again, that's why among the sort of community of survivors in Prague, this novel was not sort of, they weren't the ones rushing to defend him when the Communist Party came after him. Uh, Natalie, do you have a question to, for Brian? Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for this talk and, the, and all of the details. Um, I, I was actually quite interested in the connections that you draw to America. And I was wondering, I mean, we, we can talk about this maybe later yeah. at the round table, but the question of identity between countries, between borders and yeah. how that, that shapes these writings is, yeah. I think, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is why I think Rita is such an interesting figure. Um, and, you know, I mean, you talk about sort of a hybrid figure, right? Um, not just ling linguistically and culturally, um, um, you know, just as a mediator between these two worlds. I just like, I'm just, be, I'm just like, if there's anybody from my book, I wish I could go and meet, you know, and like, go back in a time machine and, 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 and talk to it might be her. Um, the only thing, I'll, other thing I'll mention um, is that, you know, I was talking to somebody about this, you know, one writer, American writer, uh, who I think is interesting to think of about alongside Rita Klimova is um, the recently deceased um, Janet Malcolm, she used to write for The New Yorker, um, and her memoir, Still Pictures, just came out. And it's amazing because that book's all about how her family, they were Czech Jews, escaped to New York mm -hmm. City at the same time and how her whole way of looking at the world was sort of formed by her experience in this kind of Czech emigre milieu in New York City in the 1940s and 50s. And I don't think many people knew that about her, but what I find just really interesting to think about is that kind of sliding door question. Like what if Klimova's family hadn't gone back to Prague, right? If she'd stayed in New York, I mean, clearly a brilliant woman, right? She's got a PhD in economics. She can just like casually translate a novel on the side while she's, you know, doing all this dissident work. Um, later, like becomes Havel's basically, I mean, the, the, the quotations and ideas that Havel used that inspired the world, like she's the one sort of packaging these for the Western media. Um, so I just wonder what her life might have been if she was in the US. Um, it's a, maybe she's another Janet Malcolm, maybe it's something completely different. But you know, I, I have to um, put a little wrinkle here because Jews have always acted as a cultural intermediary. Yeah. Definitely uh, in the Renaissance, especially, and in Germany too. But here, it doesn't sound to me that she's uh, really bringing a Jewish stuff to a non-Jewish environment. She's really right. a linguistic uh, mediator. Um, and she's not interpreting so much. She, she, she's just her, her skills. It's unusual, right? Those are yeah. uh, not obvious languages to, to really know well. Um, but she's not, there's nothing, I don't hear much Jewishness in what she does. She's just making one language available in another language. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how she would, like, I, I would love, like, wish we could have, like, a fifth, you know, magical box on our screen and hear how she'd answer that question, whether she would think that there was something, because for instance, you know, when I, I mentioned Yvonne Klima and Philip Roth and, you know, and Yvonne Klima uh, and right, they're all sort of part of the same social group in this period and their the relationships overlap. 
and you know uh, they were getting lots of American visitors. Um, you know, um, William Styron comes this period. You know, John Updike later comes. You know, uh, all these people are coming. But it's it's he says what was different about Roth was his own sense of connection. You know, remember that map I had up earlier about the concentration of Jewish populations in Central and Eastern Europe. There's a, there's there's a, something happening in American Jewish culture in the 1970s and 80s at the same time, sometimes referred to as sort of this moment of rediscovery of sort of Eastern Europe, right? Because these are second, third generation Jewish immigrants in the United States where they're really interested now. Their, their parents are, you know, they or their parents have achieved assimilation, but now they want to know what was left behind. What was the world they left behind? And so that curiosity about that kind of Jewish past, I think is one really big reason that people like Roth go to places like Prague in the first place. And so what I think that they find, they do sort of, they go visit the synagogues, they do these things, the Jewish cemetery in Prague, they go visit these places. Um, but then what I think they are surprised to discover is the Jews who live in Prague are people like Ivan Klima and Rita Klimova. And on some basis of that sense of, I don't know what we want to call it, Hava, but like some, you know, I, I don't want to call it post-Jewish identity, but like the sense of, I don't know, there's something there that binds them. So in terms of what enables them to be mediators or to bridge the political and cultural divides of the Cold War, I think their Jewishness is absolutely central to their, their, their role as mediators. But whether the content of sort of Jewish religious ideas plays a role in sort of the kinds of culture they're transmitting. Yeah, I think that you're you're, you're right. Like that's not the headline, right? Um, so, I mean, it's a really interesting question. It's something I've mm -hmm. thought a lot about. I mean, the volume that I'm a part of, some of the other um, sort of contributors are interested in sort of the movement of, you know, Judaica, right? Like actual, you know, uh, Jewish texts, artifacts across Cold War boundaries, Jewish cemeteries, preservation, um, you know, religious exchanges, things like that I think, you know, really have that explicit content. This is a little bit more difficult, I think, to, you know, this is the same problem I have when I teach my American Jewish literature courses, when you're trying to, like, pin down what makes Philip Roth a Jewish writer, in particular when he rejects the label, right? Um, so, and yet, we read his novels and so, you know, it's, I can't answer the question, but I think it's the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Philip Roth is a very complex relationship with his <laughs> yeah, Jewish yeah. identity. And yes. He, he's really a lot of uh, self, kind of self-hatred to say, <laughs> uh, right? He's conflicted about his Jewishness. But I have to say, when I read the Zuckerman novels, he understands Jewish history probably better than many historians. He's yeah, I mean, brilliant I, in his analysis of, of yeah, of yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think it's it is really complex. I mean, I, I, you know, I. This is becoming a little bit of a digression, but I was reading an essay recently that made a really compelling comparison between Philip Roth and, of all people, Hannah Arendt, in their own relation, complex relationship to Jewishness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it kind of blew my mind. But I mean, it. it it, it's a really complicated subject. It really is. Um, and Roth doesn't make it any easier because he's very slippery and you can't trust the things he claims. Um, and his famous use of the double allows him often to have it both ways. I mean, mm -hmm. most famously Operation Shylock where literally there's two Philip Roths in the novel, um, but in all his writing. Mm -hmm. So I think it becomes very complex, but I can tell you that, you know, he's, he writes about going to Prague and he explicitly says, you know, when he walks the streets of Prague, he imagines the places where his Jewish ancestors walked in, in Silesia. You know, he's like, he's he sort of imagining, like his imagine. there is, and he's, and, and this is exactly in the moment. I think I, I feel like I'm repeating myself because this is what we talked about in my last lecture a little bit, but, um, you know, there's a reason that the timing of his visit to Prague comes right after um, the great critic Irving Howe um, 
really the false fathers. Yeah. destroys him in a review. Uh, he writes an essay about Portnoy's complaint. And he says, it's a book that nobody should have to read twice, <laughs> which is, I think, a great takedown. Um, and, uh, but then he says, but more seriously, he says, he accuses Roth of having, quote, a thin personal culture, right? And that's, and we can, I think we can understand what he means. And I think Roth really is hurt by this. And I think it's, I think that Roth's sort of, what he does in the 1970s, you know, bringing writers like Schultz and, um, you know, in adding to the story now, while helping to kind of, I think this is, I think that that, that is a good expression of what, how he imagines the significance of his own Jewishness as a writer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. This is this is really complex. You've got one more question, I believe, and that would be our last question. Let's see. Um, there is an ORT pro school in Prague for Jewish students, or is at least an ORT program. I visited it. Great. Thank you, David. Yeah, I mean, there there's there are there's a there's a lot of opportunity there, um, certainly. Um, and then I think in the qu quotes, in the comments, someone made a comment about Leonard Cohen as a comparison. I mean, I think there's this generation, I mean, it's a lot of the people I write about, like, you know, I write about Allen Ginsberg, I write about, like, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, where there, it's a very complex subject, I think, for a lot of these figures. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us for this first of three lectures. We're looking forward to seeing all of you on um, next Tuesday, same time. And the focus is going to be a novel by David Grossman, who is really a superb Israeli writer. The title of the novel is More Than I Love My Life. So we're going to see what, I don't know the novel, so but I know many other novels by uh, David Grossman. So we'll have a wonderful evening. Uh, with Professor Joe Lockhart. So right now I'm going to say good night to all of you and see you next week.